Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihare Jai Radha Madhava Kunja
Okay, so here we go, everyone. So here we go. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, yes, very good. Thank you. Right, so everyone, please repeat after me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Right, so this evening we are reading Bhagavad Gita as it is, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Yes, Foundracharya, this 
International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So we are this evening going to read from chapter 6 titled Dhyana Yoga and we're going to read verse 46 and I suppose I just read the verse myself as it or should we attempt to do it responsibly? Um, uh, either way is fine for your discretion Maharaj. Okay. <laughs> Let's, let's give it a try. I mean, those of you who have telephones, did I, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> but those who have, who don't have two telephones. Oh. Yeah. We, have, we have a few hard copies, uh, uh, well, of soft cover Bhagavad Gita, in case you, uh, you can borrow one in case you don't have a phone, uh, the website is bit handy. Yeah, because I can just mention that um, what we call the Veda base mm -hmm. means all of Prabhupada's books and many of his classes and conversations, um, they are available free of charge. You can just download it onto your telephone or your computer, or your tablet, you know, your device. And uh, there you got it, the whole works, really. I mean, pretty much all the books, definitely. And I'd say the majority, <coughs> excuse me, majority of his lectures Again, it's chapter 6, verse 46. And we will go through the Sanskrit, word, first of all, word by word. Then we'll do it line by line. And then whoever from amongst yourselves can chant it. And then we'll do the word for word. And go on like that. So here we go. Chapter 6. Verse forty six Tapas Vibio Tapas Vibio Diko Yogi Gyani Bio P Mato Dika Karmibyash Chadiko Yogi Tasma Yogi Varjuna Tapasvi Biodiko Yogi Tapasvi Biodiko Yogi Gyani Biopi Matodika Karma Pyas Chadiko Yogi Tasma Yogi Bavarjuna Tapasvi Biodiko Yogi Yani Biopi Matodika Yani Biopi Matodika Karma Pyas Chadiko Yogi Tasma Yogi Bavarjuna Tasma Yogi Bavarjuna Tapasvi Biodiko Yogi Tapasvi Biodiko Yogi Yani Biopi Matodika Karma Pyas Chadiko Yogi Tasma Yogi Bavarjuna So some of you go ahead please Tapasthi Vyodiko Yogi Tapasthi Vyodiko Yogi Yani Vyopi Matodika Yani Vyopi Matodika 
Karmi Vyascha Diko Yogi Karmi Vyascha Diko Yogi Tasmat Yogi Babarjuna Tasmat Yogi Babarjuna Someone, anyone? Have a go, have a shot. translation a yogi is greater than the ascetic greater than the empiricist and greater than the fruitive worker therefore O Arjuna in all circumstances be a yogi right and the purport by Srila Prabhupada when we speak of yoga we refer to linking our consciousness with the Supreme Absolute Truth. Such a process is named differently by various practitioners in terms of the particular method adopted. When the linking process is predominantly in fruit of activities, it is called Karma Yoga. When it is predominantly empirical, it is called Jnana Yoga. And when it is predominantly in a devotional relationship with the Supreme Lord, it is called Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga, or Krishna Consciousness, is the ultimate perfection of all yogas. 
as will be explained in the next verse. The Lord has confirmed herein the superiority of yoga, but he has not mentioned that he has not mentioned that it is better than bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is full spiritual knowledge, and therefore nothing can excel it. Asceticism without self-knowledge is imperfect. Empiric knowledge without surrender to the Supreme Lord is also imperfect. And fruit of work without Krishna consciousness is a waste of time. <laughs> Therefore, the most highly praised form of yoga performance mentioned here is bhakti yoga and this is still more clearly explained in the next verse right let me just read this verse again tapas bibyo diko yogi gyani bio pima todika karmibyas chadiko yogi tasmad yogi bavarjuna and the translation again, a, a yogi is greater than the ascetic, greater than the empiricist, and greater than the fruitive worker. Therefore, O Arjuna, in all circumstances, be a yogi. Some prayers. Nama Om Nishnabadaya Krishna Prasthaya Uttale. Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tidhavane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishe Shunyavadi Vastucha Dejatarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivas Adi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Much come to Rubius Jagripa, Sindhu Pia Evacha, Padidana Bhavane, Bio Vaishnava, Bio Namo Namaha, Vaishnava, Bio Namo Namaha. Okay. And Krishna your father understands enough? No. No. A straight answer. I see. But he's got to practice. He's got to sit close to me. He could. He would be welcome to. He's back there. Okay, okay. So here we go, devotees and friends. This is very important verse, very interesting, nice verse, very important verse. And just a little sort of background knowledge about this verse is that this is the second to last verse in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is 18 chapters and our great spiritual teachers, people like that, they have divided those 18 into three groups. And the first group is chapter 1 to chapter 6. And where this is now the second to last verse in chapter 6 means second to last verse in that first group or first section. Then uh, chapter 7, the second group, second set, is uh, <clears throat> chapter 7 to chapter um, 12. Six chapters, chapter 7 to chapter 12. And then the third section is chapter 13 to chapter 18. And, you know, it's, it is worthwhile understanding. It's a slight, you know, slight subtlety, it's not that subtle, but it makes the whole thing a bit more interesting if you're aware of this. 
that the first section, chapter 1 to chapter 6, is describing, Krishna is focusing on different types of yogas. Different types of yogas, and I don't know if you caught it, unless of course you're someone who's very well versed in these things, like Prabhuji here. <laughs> yeah. This chapter, who, who can remember what's the name of this chapter? I, I read it out. Dhyana Yoga. Dhyana Yoga. That's one of the types of yoga. And the chapter before, chapter 5, is about Karma Yoga, as is chapter 3. Both 3 and 5 are about Karma Yoga, particular form of yoga. And then you get like in chapter 2, the chapter is not titled in that way, but still it's a fact that there is at least some part of chapter 2 is discussing um, a form of yoga which can be, can be called Jnana Yoga or Sankhya Yoga, something like that. Jnana Yoga, Jnana means knowledge, Sankhya means to analyze. So, you know, it's certainly connected with knowledge. And here and there, one or two other forms of yoga are at least mentioned or referred to briefly. So, therefore, the idea is that this first section from chapter 1 to chapter 6 is basically focused on different types of yoga. <clears throat> and here we are, like I said, it's the second to last verse of the sixth chapter, means second to last verse of that first section on, on yoga, first section in Bhagavad Gita. And Srila Prabhupada, in the purport, if you were listening carefully, you would have picked up that Prabhupada referred to bhakti yoga, which he mentions, he says here, in the purple, I'm looking at the purple, sort of in the middle more or less, bhakti yoga or Krishna consciousness is the ultimate perfection of all yogas, as will be explained in the next verse, um, verse, yeah, anyway, verse 47, which is the last verse, of course, in this chapter and in this section. And it's the verse, at least within this first section, in which Lord Krishna specifically points out bhakti yoga as distinct from other forms of yoga and as being the best form of yoga. Then, devotees and friends, Lend me your ears. Just, yeah, listen please carefully. Next section, <laughs> chapter 7 to chapter 12. Did you like that? Yeah, I loved it. You did? Okay. <laughs> Stick with us, you'll probably get a few more. <laughs> um, yeah, next section, section 2, chapter 7 to chapter 12, is specifically elaborating on that topmost form of yoga, bhakti yoga, or Krishna consciousness. The yoga, bhakti basically means serving the Lord in a mood of devotion or devotional love. So that whole section, chapter 7 to chapter 12, is just wholly and solely devoted to sort of exploring the subject of bhakti yoga, the topmost form of yoga. And then from chapter 13 to chapter 18, it is, I mean, the theme basically is described as being more or less along the lines of secondary, but still not unimportant knowledge, like if you're familiar with Bhagavad Gita, you'd know chapter 14, 
is about the modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And it's a secondary point, because the main point is to link with the Lord, to link with God through devotion, devotional service, uh, which is completely spiritual, and the modes of material nature are material. That's the whole idea, the modes of material nature. And then chapter 16, just as giving a couple of examples, chapter 16 is called the divine and demoniac natures, but practically what would you say about 90% of it is just talking about um, people who have demoniac nature like really, I mean, even extremely nasty people. Mm. Yeah. You see it in New York all the time. Yeah, and it's not restricted to New York either. <laughs> but I know it's prominent in New York because I, I have spent time in New York. <laughs> yeah. So like this. And, and then chapter 18 is bas basically a summary of the whole of Bhagavad Gita. There's not really anything or certainly not much introduced which is new in the 18th chapter. It's just reviewing basically what's been discussed before. Yeah. So, yes, so now, uh, therefore, interesting little point is that the Bhagavad Gita, the main part of the Bhagavad Gita is the middle six chapters, from chapter 7 to chapter 12. Normally when you read a book, any sort of book, be it academic or be it just a novel or something, then it all generally, it all builds up to the conclusion. That's just normally how things work, but that's not actually how it is in Bhagavad Gita other than the last chapter being a summary. But otherwise, you know, from chapter 7 to 12, Krishna really gets into this subject of Bhakti Yoga, Krishna Consciousness, which is the subject matter of the book. Just a little bit, bit of interesting background information. So here, though, Lord Krishna is focusing on, um, well, in, in a general sense, someone who's a yogi is better positioned than someone who is an ascetic. Ascetic means like a, a strict renunciate, someone who just gives up material things and, you know, lives without attachment or not just attachment, without possessing material things. Someone, we should keep an eye on the door because sometimes people want to come in. There's some people there. Sasha, Sasha, Sasha is uh, equipped for that, Maharaj. Something like Sasha there, he'll do that. Sasha. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Sasha. Invite them in. Have a good eye. Yeah, okay, so there we are. Yeah, so that's an ascetic, is, is basically a renunciate. But, but a very strict renunciate. Not just someone who gives up something for a while and then takes it up again, you know. Like when I was at university in Auckland in the 1970s, particularly 72, I studied philosophy and one of the British philosophers who I studied a bit was Bertrand Russell. You heard of Bertrand Russell? Really? Okay. Anyway, if you didn't hear about him, don't worry about it. It's not that important. But anyway, just we studied Bertrand Russell. And Bertrand Russell was, and he was living like, what would you say, more than, a bit more than 100 years ago late 19th century and into the very early 20th. And he was a philosopher, 
but he was also like a character, an entertainer. Like you remember this fellow, the scientist, well, Hawkins, you remember Hawkins? You know, he's like totally, physically, completely out of it, totally. But still, you know, he, uh, you know, he was intelligent and he was able to sort of entertain people with his presentations on scientific subject matters. Interesting little point in that regard, if I may just throw it in, is that he died and his son took over his work. And the, the last book he presented was called A Short History of Time. And it's you know, philosophical, but it's written for the average person in the street. It's not just some high-level philosophical thing which people like you and me, we just wouldn't be able to understand. It's basically quite understandable. But here's an interesting point. Consider this. That his son now has taken it over, and he said, I just read, well, not just read, but maybe a year ago, on CNN, so it must be right. <laughs> That's a joke. But anyway. I got it. <laughs> so it said there, well, just quoting him, saying that actually we have discovered or decided that, you know, quite a number of the points that my father made in his book were wrong. <laughs> so I am in the process of updating his book. Updating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I thought it was very interesting. And you know what's going to happen when he has died and his son comes? He's going to say, well, you know, my grandfather's book was updated by my father. But now I, we have decided that so many of the things my father said were wrong. So I'm going to update it. In other words... They sort of don't know what they're really talking about. But that's just by the way, more than anything. So the ascetics, and then the empiricists. Empiricists means people who develop knowledge through the senses, through just observing the world and what's going on, and, you know, that sort of idea. That's empirical knowledge. Then he mentions, so, so he mentions the ascetics, the empiricists, and thirdly, the fruit of workers. Prabhupada said, I don't know if you noted it, that fruit of work without Krishna consciousness is a waste of time. So it's even worse than being an ascetic or an empiricist. Because fruit of work basically means uh, sense gratification. If it feels good, do it. That sort of idea. The goal of life is just to gratify your senses, eat, drink, and be merry. But I was referring to, um, what's his name, Bertrand Russell. Let me just conclude that little aside, that Bertrand Russell, he was a, like an entertainer. He could present philosophy in common people's language. But, you know, at the same time, it really is philosophy. Um, yeah, so, but he was famous for having a smoking problem which he was sort of battling with. Yeah, Bertrand Russell. On and off, he'd stop and then he'd start again and then stop and quite a number of times he stopped and started. So he was interviewed one time and the interviewer, being a little cheeky perhaps, said, Mr. Mr. Russell, do you have any advice for people who would like to give up smoking. 
And Bertrand Russell responded, oh, sure, it's easy. I've done it many times. Did you get that one? In other words, you know, unstable, he would have laughed. But he, anyway. Bertrand Russell was unstable. And life on the material level tends to be unstable. And people who are living life on the material level tend to be, not just tend to be, but they are unstable. So anyway, what Krishna has said is that a yogi, someone who's a yogi, is greater than the ascetic, the renunciate, greater than the empiricist, the person who's trying to understand life by just observing and analyzing that sort of thing, and greater than the fruit of worker who's just trying to enjoy life, eat, drink, and be merry, that sort of thing. Because the yogi, the whole idea of what is a yogi, at least in the broad sense, as Prabhupada mentions, there are different practitioners who are following different particular methods of yoga. But, and, and I mentioned, you know, Karma Yoga, this chapter is Dhyana Yoga, and then there's other yogas mentioned. Um, so, but the term, in the broad sense, the term yoga means to link with God. And say, it is Barcelona. like the most popular form of yoga, I'm sure it's popular in New York, is what they call Hatha Yoga, means physical exercises. I'm sure you've heard of that, and, yeah, of course. So physical exercises, but it's yoga, physical exercises which may sort of bring you physically in tune with the Supreme more than you would normally be doing. I mean, more, more than you would normally be if you were not doing that type of yoga, you are just living a, a regular life, materialistic type of life. But if you're doing that sort of yoga, all those exercises, and there's breathing exercises also, then it brings your physical system more in tune with the divine nature, because we are surrounded by the divine nature in this world. Then another, well, karma yoga is mentioned here. Karma, in this context, karma, like many Sanskrit words, it has a few different meanings depending on, on the context in, in which it's used. But in this particular context, karma yoga, karma means your, like your, your natural duty or occupational duty in terms of your physical and psychological nature. Like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's interacting with Arjuna, who was a warrior. And Arjuna had been brought up as a warrior. From childhood. And he was like, rarely trained as a military man. So that's what came naturally to him physically and psychologically. Physically, he was a big, powerful man. And psychologically, he was into, like basically, actually, protecting people who otherwise might be, you know, abused. They call it Kshatriya, actually. And Kshat means to hurt, to cause pain. And Triya, comes from the verb, the Sanskrit verb, verb triate, 
which means to protect. So Kshatriya means a warrior who protects people from being physically abused, basically. Yeah, so that was his karma, like his natural duty in terms of his psychophysical nature. Whereas some other, you know, different people, some people are just, you know, very simple people and they just work in a factory and they don't really think of doing anything other than that. Yeah. So, so that sort of person that would be considered their karma, their occupational type of duty. Right, but karma yoga means that you do whatever is your natural occupational duty according to your physical, psychological, emotional nature, but you do it in relation to God. Therefore, it's karma yoga. If it was, if it was just karma without the yoga, it would just mean doing your, your, your duty according to your physical and psychological nature. But now it's karma yoga because it's being done for the satisfaction of the Lord. Yes, so the yogis in general, um, the yogis are better than the those who are simply karmis, not karma yogis, because then they'd be yogis. But the karmis means those people who just work to enjoy life, get money and enjoy life. So the yogis are better than the karmis or just the simple fruit of workers. And the yogis are better than the empiricists who um, view the material world and try to analyze the material world with the idea of trying to get some understanding of like what is life, that sort of idea, but without connection with the Supreme, with the Lord. Yeah, if it was, if that sort of activity like intellectual type of activity was done with a view to connecting us with God, then it would be jnana, means knowledge, jnana yoga. But otherwise it's just jnana, just knowledge for the sake of it, really. So all these different types of people then, the ascetics, the renunciants, the empiricists who try to analyze what the world is, but without connection with God. And then just the, the materialists, the fruit of workers, none of them are as good as the yogis, the yogis in general as a group. Because the yogis Whichever type of yoga they're trying to do, and different yogas, yogis are on, I mean, yogas and yogis are on different levels, but at least they're trying to connect with the Supreme, with the Supreme. Yeah. So that's the first point there, and it's really a very important point. How the yogis as a group being a group who are just like in a fundamental foundational sense in one way or the other trying to link with God they're better than these others be they sort of materialistic intellectuals mental speculators or renunciates or you know just materialists trying to get money and just increase their assets and all that. The yogis are better because they're trying to link with God. That's the point that Krishna is making. Then of course, you know, the point that follows is that all right, you've got all these different 
types of yogis. So amongst the yogis, who, which of the yogis is the best? And, you know, I don't want to do like too much of a spoiler, although I've, al <laughs> I've already done it. <laughs> but in the next verse, verse 47, Lord Krishna just very specifically focuses on the fact that the bhakti yogis, those who serve him in devotion, in a mood of love, they're the best of all yogis, but, you know, just forget that. Come back next week, Saturday, all right? Yeah. And I don't know who it will be, but someone will explain that, I'm sure. Yes, right. So it's, it's really nice. It's really very interesting because, well, you know, nowadays, particularly in the Western world, nowadays, at least 90 or 99, but at least 90% of the people are fruit of workers, means they are just, they're working in one way or another, either legally or illegally. I mean, if they're working legally, they're also probably doing some illegal things. Um, yeah. So the great majority of people are what, in the, the terminology being used here, they're fruit of workers. Working to get money, to get things material things, houses, cars, and whatnot. When I was, when I was young, it was actually in, I think it was in the 60s or something like that. It wasn't in the 70s. Um, there was an interview of J. Paul Getty. Any of you heard of J. Paul Getty? He, at the time, he was the richest man in the world they said. So they interviewed him. He was, he uh, virtually owned all the oil production in the United States. Yeah. So he was interviewed, there was like a TV show documentary about this man and his life. And they interviewed him and at one point in the interview they said, Mr. Getty, do you have a philosophy of life and Mr. Getty said, yes, I have a philosophy of life. It can be summed up in one word, more. <laughs> more <laughs> means more stuff, <laughs> more money. And then with the more money, you can get more property, you can get more motor cars. I mean, you can buy more people. <laughs> and I'm not joking, actually. Yeah. Money is like, is a passport to uh, acquiring enjoyable things or including enjoyable people. Sir, so, yes. In the Bible, though, it says, I mean, I'm pretty sure this is what you mean. The lover of money is the root of all evil. I mean, we need money to survive. Yeah, sure. Well, as Prabhupada said, um, a person or a devotee or just people should uh, work to live, mm. but not live to work. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Of course, people got to have money. You know, there's a, a tree outside there, I can see it. Um, you know, if you didn't want to work for money at all, zero, you could live under the tree, <laughs> free of charge. But it's not practical. Mm -hmm. People would not be able to live in a decent way. So, yeah. So, so... You know, what Mr. Getty was talking about was extravagance. But you need money to live, but you don't need to live extravagantly. Yeah. Prabhupada 
would say, in fact, simple living and high thinking. Simple living meaning just, you know, what you require, you know, some decent residence and some, probably some vehicle to move around, decent clothing and, you know, like that. Yeah, simple living, but then high thinking means thinking of God and thinking how to develop our relationship with God. In fact, you know, some, I know many devotees around the world in different places, and I know at least a few who, you know, they're qualified people, they have university degrees, maybe master's degrees, and they, uh, you know, so they have what would be considered good, well-paying, well even highly paying jobs. But at some point, they're offered a promotion. But they're told, or at least, you know, they're intelligent enough to understand, if I take the promotion, I'll get more money, but I'll have to work more. So these devotees, a few of whom I know, they turn down the promotion <laughs> because they, they felt, you know, I've got enough money, I've got a house, and it's, you know, it's quite adequate, and other facilities quite adequate, and I don't need more. And because I don't have to work so hard, I have time for Krishna consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> so actually there's a little mantra, so to speak, that one should try to make as much money as possible and do as little work as possible. It sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> But it's not really. And I know a few who do that. They basically don't work. Yeah. But they have income. And they are just devoted, fully engaged in devotional service. Yes, right. So, you know, this is the point that Krishna is explaining here. And, okay, let us... I mean, I think I've explored it sufficiently for the time being. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I've explored the basic idea sufficiently for the time being. So let's have a look at the questions. Oh, how's this? Please share your favorite memory about Srila Prabhupada. I guess you all know who Srila Prabhupada is. There he is here. Yeah, right. My favorite memory. Well, I have quite a number of favorite memories. In fact, practically all my memories of Prabhupada are my favorite memories. They, <laughs> share them all. They're just amazing. You just share them all. <laughs> okay. <coughs> well, we'll be here till four o'clock in the morning. Uh, but anyway... Here's one. Listen to this. Um, first time I saw Srila Prabhupada was he came to the university where I was sort of half-heartedly studying in, in Auckland, New Zealand. Second time I saw Prabhupada was when he came in by helicopter to Bhaktivedanta Manor just outside London. Um, yeah, which we had just been given by George Harrison, who I'm sure you've all heard of. Yeah, so Prabhupada came, he landed in Heathrow Airport, but then they took him in a uh, helicopter <coughs> to the manor and he landed. And there were hundreds of devotees there. When Prabhupada would come, then because he would come particularly to England in Europe. You know, he would go to Germany uh, once or twice maybe, 
France, I think, once, maybe twice. But England, a few times a year. So anyway, he landed. And there were devotees from all over Europe. They had come to, to see Prabhupada. So there's probably, I don't know, 300, 400 devotees there. And Prabhupada landed out on, there's a section of lawn there which is very, like, really flat. So the helicopter landed there. And he got out and the devotees lined up in like two rows and he walked in between the two rows from the helicopter around and back into, well, sort of the back entrance of Bhaktivedanta Manor. Then he walked along the corridor, turned around, if you know Bhaktivedanta Manor, turned around and then he came to the bottom of the stairs to go up to his quarters. Right, and I was at that end of the line because I was one of the new boys. Yeah. So Prabhupada came, walking along, coming to the bottom of the stairs, and he's about to go up, but just before, like maybe six feet before the, uh, the beginning of the stairs, he stopped, and someone, one of member of his party asked him something, I don't know what, but he stopped and he was then interacting with this devotee about something. And we were there at the end of the line, and so we bowed down to offer our obeisances to Prabhupada, but now Prabhupada is standing there, and he stood there for a, a few minutes, and we were down. And we didn't know what to do. Should we stay down or get up and just go on with life? <laughs> so we took the conservative approach. We stayed down. <laughs> and we're just down for a couple of minutes. And this one devotee next to me, so sort of just before me, yeah, he, uh, Prabhupada was directly opposite him. So what he did, this devotee next to me, he very quietly and, you know, gently put his hand forward and Prabhupada was a little distance away, but put his hand forward and forward and touched Prabhupada's lotus foot. Haribo. Then he turned, so we're down and Prabhupada's there and he's here and I'm on this side. So then he turned to me, we're down, so like this, he turned to me and went like that, pointing towards Prabhupada. So, yeah, he wanted me to try to stick my hand out, but it was further. Prabhupada was a little further away from me. I mean, maybe a foot or something further away. So, okay, okay, put out my hand slowly. <laughs> out went my hand. But, you know, I had to really kind of stretch. And one of the devotees who was there with Prabhupada, some of you would remember, was Brahmananda Swami at the time. He was a big, heavily built ex New York wrestling champion. And he had a big sannyas rod, danda. So I, as my hand is going out with his danda, he went bang on my hand. So I quickly withdrew my hand. But, you know, this, the devotee next to me is watching all of this. So I withdrew my hand, okay, yeah, okay. Didn't work. But now the other devotee, he's like this, you know, because we're, we're down. So, but he went, no, go on, like that. So I tried again. All right, up goes the hand, and out. And Brahm Brahmananda must have been preoccupied there. He didn't notice. Or if he did notice, he didn't react. But I really had to stretch and stretch 
and stretch that oh, I just managed to touch Prabhupada's lotus foot. And maybe that's why I'm still here. <laughs> that was 73, so more than 50 years ago. He looks strong. Huh? He looks strong. Oh. <laughs> Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> sure, it's beautiful. You're awesome. I like how you lecture. Well, yeah. You know what they say? One thing they say: old age is not for sissies. <laughs> and I, physically, I am old. But anyway, I'm carrying on, and life is nice, so we carry on. So, okay, that was. One of my favorite memories, there are others. I could tell you another funny little one, which I didn't experience, but a devotee who I knew very well, Tribhuvanath. Maybe some of you heard of Tribhuvanath. He was also British, or actually Irish. And yeah, he was there in London, England most of the time. And in 72, Prabhupada was there in London for a while, and Prabhupada did a series of lectures in a hall in London called Conway Hall. It's somewhere out Knightsbridge Way, if you know London at all. And so they drove, he was staying in our central London Templeberry place, which is just right in the center, basically. So he's being driven to this, this program in Conway Hall. And the route took him past uh, Buckingham Palace, because there's the sort of like the driveway is just a public road, it's a big wide road. And you go right up to in front of the palace and turn left. So they're going along, they're approaching Buckingham Palace, and Tribhuvanath told me this, he was there, that the one other devotee who was in the vehicle with them said, Srila Prabhupada, you know what? One of the guards from Buckingham Palace has become a devotee. Yeah, very important man. You know these ones with the black the Busbies, they call them. So this devotee was saying, you know, he's a very important man because he's part of the security or whatever of the palace. Yes, oh, and he's become a devotee. Oh, it's important. Yeah, he's an important man. And Srila Prabhupada very nonchalantly said, and what about the queen? <laughs> <laughs> Just dry humor. What about the Queen? Anyway, interestingly enough, the Queen had many interactions with Hare Krishna devotees over the years. Many, actually. And one time she was in, a, in our school in Harrow, it's like West London. We have quite a substantial school there, a good few hundred students. And she, the, the, the children had an evening or afternoon like Arati. They have a temple room and, you know, they sing and they offer things, their deities there. And the queen was there for like about 20 minutes during the arati and the kirtan and everything and met some of the children. Right, let's see, let's carry on. <laughs> My wife recently asked, what is the real proof of afterlife in Vedic, in the Vedic tradition compared to the Christian tradition? which the person who wrote it down said, eternal life in heaven or hell. That I guess he's putting forward as the Christian idea. 
So what is the real proof of afterlife? You know, uh, there, there's a whole like subset of science dealing with like what what do they call it? I forget what they call it, but you know, experiences or memories apparently apparently of of a previous lifetime. Yeah, yeah, but no, there's a term, there's a specific term for it. Ret retrogression. Regress. Yeah. yeah, anyway, these sorts of things. <laughs> but, but, I mean, acknowledging that that little sub-branch of, you could say, informal science exists, we don't necessarily take it so seriously. Yeah, in fact, we would not get up and say, there it is. This is the answer. You must tell your wife. You know, this is the proof. Because we don't really necessarily take it so seriously. I mean, certainly it's interesting enough. But proof, I don't really think we should depend on it as being truth. So, but the real proof of afterlife. Well, you know, real proof. At least one important consideration is that there are, I mean, it's sort of anecdotal, you could say, like these other things I was just mentioning, but <coughs> these anecdotes come from very, very special people, not just some sort of ordinary guy off the street, but, and they describe the afterlife, or afterlife, but the next life, yeah. Um, in other words, I would say that we cannot present like solid proof sort of objective proof of there being a next life other than there's sort of a, a type of logic behind it in that we are eternal this is what Bhagavad Gita says and I mean even the Bible what does it say um, what is the profit for a man if he gains the whole world but loses his eternal soul. Any Bible specialists here? I think that's, you know, to that effect it's in the Bible. Reference to that the eternal, some eternal aspect of our existence. And that tends to be there in, in the different, you know, religions and different traditions. So, of course, in Bhagavad Gita, the subject is explored at great length and in very logical ways. For example, that <clears throat> we're eternal as the first sort of, let's just say, okay, except that we are eternal. These bodies are temporary. You know, when you're little, like your son, it seems like life is just going to go on and that's just, that's it. But when you get to my age, or the age of a couple of us here, I think the oldest person in the room is just sitting back there, the blonde lady. I won't tell you her age, but your she's age, old. Your age is not your age. Okay. Well, I am, yeah, as a spirit soul. <laughs> My body is 73, and she's older than me, and a very good person. So anyway, yeah, the body is temporary, and the older you get, the more clear the fact that the body is temporary, the more clear that becomes. I remember when I turned 40, 
And I thought, like my father lived to be 80, my mother lived to be 92. And so I thought, yeah, well, I'm probably about halfway there. <laughs> but I still seem, yeah, there's plenty of time. <laughs> but then I turned 60 after some time and I thought, you know, bit of a countdown is coming. <laughs> We don't know exactly what the countdown is, but it's something like that. So that we're eternal, this is basically, this point is there in all religious traditions, and it's very much there in Krishna consciousness. We are eternal persons, and these bodies are temporary, and we are, the eter as eternal persons, we are loaning, you could say loaning, our consciousness to these bodies. We are learning just our life, living the fact that we're living to these bodies. Yeah. And when the soul, the eternal person, leaves the body, then immediately the body is finished. And that's it. There's no life, there's no consciousness. Yes, yeah, so what happens to the eternal soul? That's the question. Now, according to our, whoever wrote this question, the Christian tradition says there's eternal life in heaven or hell. I mean, just in a sense of like reasonableness or logic, it doesn't really seem such a sort of clever idea because even if you're like a really lousy person <laughs> a candidate for hell but maybe when you go there maybe you'll realize wow I'm having a hell of a time <laughs> I, I got to do something about myself because I'm eternal I got to do something about myself so, yeah, you might pull yourself together. I mean, it happens. People who are in sort of rotten situations of their own creation pull themselves together sometimes. So, why should it be eternal life in heaven or hell? The Vedic tradition says that, <clears throat> you know, what, how you live, then you create your next life, and how you live in that life you create the life after that in very simple terms. So it seems more logical if there's the initial assumption that we're all eternal persons. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, let's just leave it at that for the time being. So we've got, ladies and gentlemen, Three more questions. How can I find peace and love? Okay, now that's a good question, important question. Um, you know, I can tell you a little story. It's a nice little story about Lord Krishna and his mother, Yashoda that Lord Krishna for his first three years that he was present on this planet, he was at home with his mother, as is basically the case for all children. For the first few years, they're at home with their mothers. So he was, he was at home with his mother. Then when he was three, he started herding the calves, the baby cows. So now he's out for several hours every day and his mother is alone at home so she really missed him she really missed him I mean any mother generally would miss their child under such circumstances so she really missed him but anyway she kept carried on doing her household duties and so on and as she's cleaning her she's cleaning around and what does she find? A pair of little shoes that belong to Krishna. 
and she sees these shoes, she's already remembering Krishna and missing Krishna so much. But now she sees these shoes and she knows, ah, oh, these are Krishna's shoes. So that the, the you know, the, the memory and remembrance is just intensified greatly because, not because she's into shoes, but because she knows they're Krishna's shoes. And they remind her of Krishna. In fact, in a certain sense, she doesn't exactly just see the shoes, but she sees Krishna. So there's a principle there. And the principle is that actually, everything in this world, everything, everyone, all living entities and just the world itself. It all belongs to Krishna. And if, like Mother Yashoda, if you really love Krishna, she saw the shoes, but it wasn't just limited to the shoes. She would see some other things of Krishna's. And then again, a flood of remembrance like that. So someone who really loves Krishna and who understands very clearly this is Krishna's world and all the people in this world are Krishna's people and just even the insects and the animals and just every living being, they're all Krishna's yeah, living entities and the mountains are Krishna's mountains and the seas are Krishna's seas, everything like that. Um, a person who really loves Krishna like she loves Krishna will see everything like that and feel affection, appreciation for the whole creation because it belongs to Krishna who she loves. So, yeah, if you want to develop, like you could say, a type of universal love, that's the way to do it. Because then it'll be universal in the absolute sense, completely universal. Love for Krishna. Um, because of that love for Krishna, you'll love everyone. You'll even love the people who don't like you. Yeah. And even, you know, maybe like some people hate you, but you'll love them. <laughs> because you know these are my brothers and sisters and you know maybe they're sort of a bit off track at the moment but they're still my brothers and sisters and there's na a natural bond in that sense so yeah so if th in this way you can find like universal love and when you have universal love then you'll find peace because even your enemy, you'll, you'll feel affection for. And if your enemy tries to do something to you, but it just, it won't faze you. You'll still feel love for the, the person. And in that way, you'll be peaceful. Yes, sir. All right. I, I I just wanted to ask a question about that point you just about your answer to the last question. Okay. So um, you gave an example that um, someone who's who is Krishna conscious like this that um, that they can feel about certain people who might feel hatred towards them. Yet they they may see them as their friend, or they may see them. They may be fond of them. Yeah. Even the such persons hate them. And I'm wondering. So my question is, where, where there is such a such circumstances exist, right. um, and of course that that person is Krishna conscious, who's friendly towards someone who hates him back. Of course, let's say, good first thing to do is try to make the relationship good both ways but if that doesn't seem uh, effective is it is it not the best thing to do to 
typically avoid that person association okay. to avoid their doing something that might be yeah, offensive sure. towards the I devotee of exactly Krishna. What you mean. Yeah. Yes. Like Prabhupada said, you may feel love for a tiger in that this context. This is Krishna's tiger. So, but then doesn't mean you go and embrace the tiger. So it doesn't mean the person's kind of naive or like incredibly naive. <laughs> yeah. I used to surf back in the old days. I'll just, I'll be with you. It's okay. Yeah, I used to surf. And a couple of times I saw sharks quite close to me. Yeah. Oh, surfing. Surfing. Oh, yeah. I didn't yeah. surf. Sorry. Surfing. <laughs> right. And so I got out of the water very quickly. <laughs> and I survived, as you can see. Yeah. So it's not that the person would think, Oh, this is Krishna's shark. How wonderful. I must embrace Krishna's shark. They're not stupid. Actually, they're extremely intelligent generally, extremely intelligent. So they may feel affection for a person who's inimical towards them, and they just, you know, avoid the person. Why bother sort of trying to interact when it may agitate them further? And otherwise just leave them, or try to help them, but if you can't help them, don't sort of beat them over the head, you know, and just go on and on and on and on. So you, your point is right. Good point. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, sir. What is your name, may I ask? William. William. What point did you want to make, William? It wasn't a point. Okay, whatever. Whatever. What, what, did, what, what did you want to say? Um, I was at the Sri Sri Radha temple today, and they gave a class. Uh -huh. And um, I kind of felt a reflection of what he was trying to say, but I don't know if it makes sense. So I was hoping he could help me with this one. I can um, try, yeah. Sri um, um, Shaitanya Mahaprabhu was chastised by someone who, who did it in public, I constantly. See. And um, he tried to find fault with uh, Sri um, Shaitanya Mahaprabhu all the time. Every little thing he did. He oh, okay. <laughs> Ramachandra Puri. Yeah. <laughs> He's famous. Notorious. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, carry so on. my question is: Is that in the same context? Like, if someone like tries to make you look stupid, um, and in front of the public trying to and showing hatred towards you is that the same is that the same or would you react the same way what do you mean is that is that the same kind of of uh, emotion well lord chaitanya in that situation due to the sort of situation socially he couldn't avoid that person. If he could have, he probably would have just, you know, <laughs> given the person a miss. But he couldn't avoid him. Oh. So what he did, Lord Chaitanya, under those circumstances, he did what that person suggested, sort of, you know, it, it was not a good suggestion, but it was what the person suggested. Lord Chaitanya followed the suggestion. Yeah. But the person, Ramachandra Puri, after a little while, not so long, some weeks, he he left town. And that was that was that. And he wasn't seen again. But you know, in an interesting little point is that Ramachandra Puri, you know, he was really kind of offensive to so many, to almost anyone actually. Mm. Yeah, because he really thought he was he was pretty cool. Mm. And and it was like his God given duty 
to correct everyone. Yeah. Like, for example, he would say, you stop playing with your telephone. <laughs> and you, what are you doing sitting on a chair? You should be sitting on the floor. <laughs> what are you? You're a materialist. This is how he would treat people. He just he was a professional fault finder. Yeah, so, but anyway, but the point I was going to make is that he is a special person who appeared in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes to play a particular role. And he is in Krishna's pastimes in the kingdom of God where he plays kind of the same type of role. In Krishna's pastimes, he's known as Jatila. And, he, and Jatila is the mother, female, is the mother of Radharani's so-called husband. But it's just part of the pastimes. Yeah, she's like antagonistic towards Krishna. Yeah, but it's just to sort of heighten the pastime, the, the emotions and the whole ex the experiences of the pastimes. <clears throat> so in that case, she was appearing as a he, but doing the same sort of things, criticizing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, criticizing basically. And when uh, Ramachandra Puri left, moved on to his next destination. The devotees had a festival. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, like, oh, you're going to go. Well, like when people leave, leave a job that they'd been at a long time, they had a little farewell party and may some people give a speech, give them a gold watch or something. But they, they had a festival like, wow, it's so great he's gone. <laughs> Fantastic. Right, so now we have two more. What's the time? It's 7.30. The night is young. Yeah, <laughs> until 4 o'clock. Long okay. well, is 4.30, so we got time. Okay, so here's one. How can one surrender to the Supreme Lord? <clears throat> yes, well, of course, you know, that's the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita. The conclusion is we should, we must, we should surrender to the Lord and give up our independent programs of just doing our things. And we should take up a way of life of serving the Lord, that's surrender. I mean, obviously surrender is pretty much a kind of military type of term. That sort of, you know, it applies in that type of situation. But it's the way Prabhupada has translated the particular Sanskrit verse. Yeah, just give up all, like, basically give up all concocted forms of religion and just surrender to me, Krishna says. Yeah. So how can we surrender to the Supreme Lord? Well, you know, in principle, what you do is you just say, okay, I'm going to give up my independent program and just serve the Lord every day, all day. I remember when I first read Bhagavad Gita, it was early 73. I had just moved into the temple in London and they were telling me I must read Bhagavad Gita, I must read Bhagavad Gita, so I picked it up. And it didn't take me long, maybe three weeks or so. I mean, I read pretty studiously. So I finished in about three weeks. And at the end was that verse we should surrender to Krishna. And I remember closing the book and putting it down and thinking, yeah, 
I have to surrender to Krishna. <laughs> it just it was logical. But, yeah, okay, what could, what to do? It's like two and two equals four. Yeah, what can you do? That's it. <laughs> I should surrender to Krishna. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you know, back well, you can surrender to Krishna means you should dedicate your life and your life's activities to the service of Krishna. Now, your, it would depend, I mean, in, in a certain context, in a certain context, you could just give up your way of life and just take up service to Krishna and that's it. But in a more sort of like common current type of situation, whatever is your natural duty, like I, we were talking about Arjuna earlier, he was a warrior. And so Krishna engaged him. He surrendered to Krishna by doing warrior activity to protect people from being abused, but doing it for Krishna in a Krishna conscious context. Yeah, so if you're a doctor, like, you know, we have many doctors, many devotees who are doctors, loads of devotees who are doctors. And like in where I'm based now in South Africa, we have many devotees who are doctors. And, you know, even like, high-level specialists. So what they do, they give medical help to the devotees free of charge. Yeah, that's what you could do if you're a doctor. Are you a doctor? She's a mother. See, you can be a mother for Krishna. Bring up your child to be a devotee. What's your son's name? Rama. Wow. Rama, Haribo. How are you doing? He speaks English? Yeah, he does. Rama, how are you doing? He's just shy. He's yes, it's okay. And I'm sure you're a good boy, Rama. <laughs> yes. Haribo, Rama. Hari Rama. <laughs> So yeah, that surrender to look after your child, not just, you know, in the general way, but, you know, in a sort of general way, but bring up your child to be a devotee. That surrender. Not that she should give up being a mother and just abandon Rama and just go and serve Krishna, you know, wherever, in some other way. She should be a Krishna conscious mother. Yeah, which you're doing. Good work. Right, so yeah, if you're a business person, make lots of money and give it to Krishna. Or at, le at least give, you know, a, a reasonable amount to Krishna. Yeah. And that can be, a, that principle can be applied in almost any type of occupation. The only occupations where you couldn't really do it would be like as a butcher yeah. or, you know, running a, a bottle store, selling liquor, cigarettes, you know, all this sort of stuff. Then we'd say, you know, get another, get a different business. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a business person and you're into, you know, buying and selling, get another type of business. Yeah. We have, we have one devotee who's actually in Gita Nagari. In fact, he's the president of the temple. He's a nuclear scientist. And he worked in a nuclear power station capable of creating nuclear bombs. 
But he felt, no, this is not the right occupation. <laughs> so he became temple president <laughs> in Kitanagari. Right, here we go, last one. Are you ready? Okay. Is there an optimal duration for daily meditation? Isn't that a good question? Yeah. Yeah, right. The optimal duration is, I mean, at least, how to say, at least if you're doing it regularly and you're into it, then the optimal duration is as long as it takes you to chant 16 rounds on the beads, which in so many cases would be plus or minus a couple of hours, something like that. That would be the optimal duration, but it's not based on just the time. It's, it's based on chanting a particular number of rounds and how long it would take. The time involved would depend on how you chant. But otherwise, if, you, if you're kind of new to it, then we would advise you, we would generally advise a person who's just never done it before and they're just starting for the first time. Tomorrow is going to be the first time they've done it. They, yeah, we would advise them probably, you know, chant, maybe chant for half an hour. And it's a little arbitrary, really, but maybe half an hour. If they're enthusiastic, you know, half an hour. If they're sort of, you know, not so enthusiastic, maybe 15 minutes. But I don't think we would really suggest to do less than 15 minutes because you can't, you're not going to really get into it and get much out of it in 15 minutes. You've got to put a bit of time into it. Hare Krishna. There we go, everyone. Thank you.